Our next, uh, our next panel is from Australia and uh, from the University of Western Sydney. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to what should be another fabulous panel. Hello and welcome to the University of Western Sydney. Uh, we're very pleased to be taking part in this uh, Around the World Symposium again after uh, really enjoying our participation last year. My name is Harold Short. I'm a visiting professor of digital humanities here. Uh, our session today is based uh, at the Parramatta campus, the beautiful campus of the university, and in fact the venue for next year's Digital Humanities 2015 conference. Uh, so that'll be in two, just over a year from now. And we're hoping that many of the people who are participating in this Round the World Symposium will be coming to our, our conference. Uh, the, my job is really just to start, kick things off and to introduce the person who will be chairing the, the session for us, and that's uh, Paul Arthur, who is uh, Australia's first professor of digital humanities and is the leader of the uh, research group. And I should just mention, uh, in passing, that uh, uh, our colleague, Jason Ensor, has uh, been doing a lot of the work uh, preparing for this event. Uh, besides his many uh, scholarly achievements, Jason is also uh, a master of the technical uh, and so has been looking, looking after the preparations. Uh, so, without further ado, I will hand over to Paul Arthur. Thanks, Harold. Well, this is fantastic to have this opportunity to participate in um, this important research event, which is a global event. Um, it's a pleasure for us to represent our region in participating in the Around the World Privacy and Surveillance in the Digital Age Conference. Uh, today we'll hear from a number of members of our research program who will address the theme from different angles. Digital Humanities is a major research focus at the University of Western Sydney, bringing together academic, technical and professional experts across disciplines as diverse as computer science, life information studies, law and justice, psychology, communication, health, education, history, design, cultural studies, creative writing, music and linguistics. Our research group has a core staff and a membership of around 50 researchers across the university that are actively engaged in current collaborative projects. The purpose of the group is to be an institutional framework and an intellectual community to support the kinds of large and interdisciplinary projects that would not otherwise be tackled. Positioning digital humanities analytical methods at the center of those investigations. But my job is to chair this session for the next hour or so, and it won't be me speaking most of the time, it'll be uh, the, uh, a number of members of our group. And what I'll do is I'll introduce them by giving them a, their short bios to you now, and then we'll invite them to come up one at a time and give their presentations. Uh, the first speaker that we have is Ned Rossiter, who we're actually across to uh, in, in Seattle. Uh, Ned's a professor of communication in the School of Humanities and Communication Arts, and he's also a member of the Institute for Culture and Society. He's investigating global logistics industries and the intersections between la labour regimes, IT infrastructures, electronic waste industries, and questions of informational sovereignty. Next, we'll hear from Simon Burroughs, a historian of the European Enlightenment and French Revolutionary era. He moved to UWS from the University of Leeds in 2013 to pursue his digital work on the French book trade in Enlightenment Europe. His interests span print culture and the history of the book, intellectual and political history, gender history, and the study of cultural transfers. Following Simon, Jen Ireland is a lecturer in the School of Law at UWS, where she convenes the intellectual property law and media law area. Her specialties are in intellectual property and media law with a focus on social media and the law. She also has interests in development and implementation of research-led innovations in blended and e-learning in tertiary and legal education, as well as experience in legal and electronic publishing prior to academic life. Tanya Knockley is a lecturer in internet studies and convergent media in the School of Humanities and Communications. 
attached to us. She's been working as the media producer, trainer and researcher since 1998, primarily in the UK, Nepal, Sri Lanka, India and Australia, uh, and with social justice and human rights organisations, as well as community media centres, online media initiatives and with the tertiary education sector. Her research is focused on understanding how communication technology and network use impacts on social and cultural participation. Kami Webganum joined the Justice Research Group as a research fellow in 2014. She received her PhD in Peace and, and Conflict Studies. Her research is focused on the dynamics of unity and conflict within West Papua's independence movement. More broadly, she's interested in Melanesian indigenous rights and politics and concepts and mechanisms of justice there. Then we'll hear from David Tate, leader of the Justice Research Group and a scholar in criminology and sociology with a background in social statistics, guardianship and mental health, sentencing, jury research and urban sociology. He's uh, currently a coordinator of the Court of the Future Network and has a special interest in justice processes, particularly how justice is performed and experienced in different cultural and national settings. Uh, Harold has also just mentioned Jason Ensor, who I'll mention again, you won't see him on camera, but he is the person behind um, facilitating this session in the technical sense. He's Research and Technical Development Manager in Digital Humanities for the School of Humanities and Community. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we have two additional guests who will participate, I think, in the final panel, and that is Willard McCarty, who is Professor in Humanities Computing at King's College London and a visiting professor here in Digital Humanities in the University of Western Sydney. We're very fortunate to have you with, with us, Willard, and we're also fortunate to have Professor Harold Short. Uh, who is also a long-time contributor and founder of the uh, Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, where he's been um, since 1988. We've been fortunate for him to also be visiting UWS as a visiting professor in, in Digital Humanities. Uh, and, and Willard and Harold, uh, Harold have been key to the establishment of, the, of this group over the last five years. So we have um, other people in the room who you won't be able to, um, who I can't introduce right now, but we're all looking forward to the, this session. Uh, so what I'd like to do first, if we're ready for it, is to throw across to Ned Rossiter from Seattle, who's going to be speaking to us on the topic of coded vanilla, logistical media and the determination of action. Ned. Okay, Paul, thank you very much and thank you also for the organisers of this uh, quite extraordinary feat in logistics around the world. Um, today I'll say a little bit about uh, a project that I'm doing at the Institute for Culture and Society entitled Logistical Worlds and I believe that you can see the um, page of that up on your screen now. You won't be able to see me at all which is just as well. I'm very jet lagged at the moment and there's a glitch between MacBook Air and the software we're using for this conference which doesn't allow my camera to work, so I'm quite fortunate. But I can show you my uh, uh, the project site and a, a few other bits and pieces. So I'll first just go quickly through this project site that we're doing um, with collaborators in India, uh, Greece and Chile primarily. And then I will talk a little bit about this world of um, coded vanilla software that drives uh, logistical economies and global supply chains. So first of all, we have this interest, as Paul indicated in his summary of my uh, research biography, around the intersection of infrastructure, software and labour. Um, and one of the reasons we have this interest is we believe that um, uh, in tandem these three things are rarely brought together. Uh, and, and also we'd suggest that uh, digital humanities research, by and large, um, has not been enormously attentive to the world of um, um, business software um, nor global economies. So one of the challenges we find in developing this research is to indeed think about how uh, those sort of interests might inform the development of research methods that 
uh, contribute something to digital humanities research. So to give you a brief kind of overview of this project, um, I could say that uh, one of the guiding sort of theses of the research is to look at the ways in which um, we might understand China-led globalization um, through infrastructure. And I see there's a bit of a delay in what you're seeing on the screen at your end and what I'm seeing, so I'll have to try and kind of slow myself down while the image catches up. Um, what you can see here is the three key sites we'll be looking at, at the, in the project. Uh, there are two ports, um, starting on the far left in um, Piraeus in Athens. Um, following that, we'll be looking at uh, Calcutta um, at the level of urban infrastructure and, and some of the port infrastructure, as well as what's been termed for geostrategic purposes the New Silk Road, which uh, connects uh, these three sites together, again through the operation of global infrastructures. And finally, we'll be moving on to Valparaiso, a port city in Chile. Um, one of the um, sort of features of this research, along with the interest in infrastructure, software, and labor, is indeed the sort of collective method which underpins um, the research that we do. So it's crucial that we have our, our partners undertaking research for up to a year or so. Uh, in each of these sites, we have found ourselves working best with activist researchers, with um, uh, media researchers, um, uh, with political sociologists, and um, the, the design element comes through more at the level of the um, site, obviously, um, but also a video game that we're in the process of developing, also provisionally titled Logistical Worlds. And we see that as central to the research method that we bring to this project, uh, as it might connect to digital humanities, uh, in as much as the, um, the video game isn't just a, a serious game, which is the genre that it will operate in, but more importantly, we're hoping to design it in such a way that it becomes a, a conceit um, for gathering data, which would otherwise be... Um, not accessible or easily accessible. More traditional humanities methods would use things like interviews, questionnaires, surveys. And instead we're seeing um, the game design has been underpinned by this um, logic of, of um, uh, users needing to supply data in order to play the game. Uh, so that might be data around um, productivity, uh, statistics associated with port, um, uh, labor or uh, associated with um, containers coming off ships. It might be uh, statistics around truck driving times. Uh, this is all for us to be decided and developed a bit more. Um, so in the second part of this talk, I'm just going to switch quite quickly more to uh, what the title of my talk actually was, which was Coded Vanilla. And here I'm interested in continuing some work I've been doing in trying to develop a theory of logistical media. This is work that um, sort of contests um, some of the research we're seeing that defines the field of software studies generally more than digital humanities, though uh, it would be a mistake not to see an overlap between these two idioms of research in the last few years. Uh, as many people in software studies have been moving into digital humanities for, I think, quite institutionally strategic reasons. Uh, the, the work that I'm doing around software studies, if I could call it that, what I prefer to call it is a theory of logistical media, is really about um, bringing a critical attention to, um, uh, as I said, uh, business um, uh, software that goes by the name of enterprise resource planning systems, um, or customer relationship manager systems or supply chain management systems. All of these as well um, have what are called modules within them that relate to logistics. Uh, the page that you might be able to see now on, on your site is from the world's uh, leading software developer in enterprise systems, which is SAP, a, a German-based um, software developer, who um, claims to touch I like this phrase they have. They claim to touch 63% of the world's trade through their systems. So this begins to indicate uh, the real kind of substantial way in which global economies 
uh, organized, coordinated, and interfaced through uh, software that largely remains a black box to the uh, uh, people undertaking critical research, whether that's in um, digital humanities, in, in media theory, um, certainly software studies, where you do tend to find some researches in business, business and management studies, no surprise, organization studies, IT to an extent as well, but not as we know the digital humanities so far. So I get I'm also wanting to sort of say, well, let's, let's see what happens when we place some critical attention around this type of software. And um, uh, here, you know, we begin to see issues of privacy and surveillance coming into play. Um, this is software that measures uh, the performance and productivity of labor, as well as finance and the movement of people and things along global supply chains. And it measures, measures these activities in real time. This is the, the kind of novelty of the software system that gives uh, the, the manager the kind of bird's eye view of the operational uh, activities within not just their organization, but uh, in principle across global supp across supply chains um, that various people may be contributing to in some way or another. Uh, but along with that, we're starting to see this software not sort of limited at all to global logistics industries, but it's also used within um, the mining industries, the health sector, uh, education sector um, in particular, somewhere that I have uh, an interest in, of course. And here we really start to see an erosion of privacy uh, in ways that the uh, labor, I would call it that, involved in producing the data that is then used to aggregate, coordinate, and oversee operations within an organization is, um, is not um, made visible in the sense that um, the people generating the data are not aware of the ends to which that data is put. And so there are serious privacy and surveillance issues here, particularly when we think of the way in which um, some university managers I've, I've heard express some excitement around the way in which the data generated through these systems can supplement um, dwindling government funds for research, teaching, university operations more broadly. Uh, so, you know, there isn't even the gestural kind of end-user agreement that we find in most software that we use, uh, whether it's open source or whether it's, it's software we pay for. Instead, this sort of hums away in the background as we go about our daily routines. Um, and it's used in a way that I think uh, social media um, has kind of developed much of its economy around data mining. So I haven't been able to say a lot there, but I think I've probably been going on for my 10 minutes um, by the look of it. Um, and I guess what I would do to conclude is to say that um, one of the major challenges then I think we face um, as our world becomes increasingly managed by this sort of software is to think of strategies of, of refusal, of, um, of uh, subtraction rather than extraction would be one way of framing that. Uh, and to continue to look at ways in which um, labor, life, research, intellectual work may be able to be conducted uh, in ways that isn't kind of subject to the kind of surveillance technologies that I think we see characterized by this type of software. So uh, I hope that contributes something, and I'll be very interested in what my colleagues have got to say following this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ned. That was um, that was fantastic for you to be able to join us from from a distance, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, and we are not going to take questions in the normal format, in, in the electronic format. Rather, we're going to go through the the uh, presentations, and then at the end have a, a kind of round table where we have the opportunity to talk talk through some issues, if time permitting. Uh, so thanks, Ned. Now next we're going to move on to Simon Burroughs, who will talk on the topic of 30th August 1777, 12th June 1783, a digital impact assessment of two censorship measures. Thanks, Simon. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Jason, as well, for everything done the of this conference. Um, so I'm going to address today's topic uh, primarily by speech-related case studies. Um, 
that offer us a digital insight into censorship, surveillance, and control of the book trade in past historical societies. Um, digital technology has, of course, given powerful means in political opposition or the effectiveness of censorship through, for example, social media in today's world. But it also gives us powerful new means to look at issues of the impact of censorship measures in past societies, even though much more limited data is available for such societies. One such means is via the technologies of the FUPTI database, that stands for French Book Trade in Enlightenment Europe database, which was developed by a team under my direction at the University of Leeds and is now being hosted and further developed here by the team at UWS, which includes Paul Arthur and Jason Ensor, um, and is designed to make, to make available a, a globally transferable technology for studying the dissemination, reception, ownership, production, and policing of books, um, and potentially other cultural artifacts as well. Um, the structure of the database is available there online, um, where it was first published in mid-2012. Um, what the database measures is the trade of a single, but supposedly representative, Swiss publisher, holster of books, the Société Typographique de Neuchâtel, which due to time constraints, and because historians of my field invariably use an abbreviation for it, known as the STN in the rest of the paper. It records all the books traded by the STN between 1730 and 1794, charting from whence they were sourced and to where they were sold. The main building blocks of the database are 70,000 transactions, defined as the purchase by a single bookseller um, or other client of the STN sale. Uh, by the same to the STM of a certain number of copies of a single edition of single work on a single day. And with those building blocks, um, by manipulating those building blocks of uh, our forms of interrogation, we can answer all sorts of questions about the dissemination and reception of those books over time in increments that go as small as the single day or as long as the full 25 year period. So the slide shows a very um, simplified database. You're picking up on hand signals that I'm not giving you, Jason, sorry. I'm obviously moving my head or hands too much. Um, the slide now shows, um, now shows the schema for the database. It reveals its main sections, primarily concerning clients, books, and events. These are three on the top bar I've put them, that's my simplest schema, and then the lower, slightly more complex schema is that we have a number of things attached to those sections, um, including markers of the illegality of books. And I say markers because there was no simple law that said this book is legal or this book is illegal in the 18th century. Exactly what was illegal was problematic for the authorities um, and for readers and for people engaged in the trade um, and varied from simply publishing a book that hadn't gone through the full permissions processes but was totally innocuous through piracies, many of them made abroad in Switzerland by the STN, through to highly illegal works of pornography or political attacks on the regime or worst of all religious attacks on the church. These highly illegal works are defined above in a corpus of about 800 works, and it's a corpus of clandestine literature that was developed by the leading American 18th century scholar Robert Danton, and this will be important for what follows. One of the minor original goals of the FUPTI database was to measure the impact on Swiss publishers of a book trade decree passed on the 12th of June 1783, which attempted to control the circulation of clandestine works. Previous scholars have suggested that this measure for a while seriously disrupted the illegal trade, and I suspected it may have done permanent damage to the trade as a whole. But was it correct, and if so, how far? Um, the background 
we need to go back to the mid-1780s, when the French government took several measures against French extraterritorial publishers operating along their eastern border, um, publishing houses pirated popular works and flooded seriously clandestine illegal works into the French market. The most decisive of these measures was a decree of the 12th of June 1783, ordering that all book imports must travel via Paris for inspection by the Parisian book. The ostensible reason for this measure was the need to prevent the entry into France of scandalous pamphlets against France's Austrian-born queen, Marie Antoinette. This was probably only a pretext, however. Redirection for Paris massively increased the cost of sending books from Switzerland to the French provinces. It particularly harmed those the Swiss rather than Dutch or their Rhenish rivals because they were located further from Paris and therefore their books had to go by a longer circuitous route. But how effective was it against its ostensible target? The clandestine trade in highly illegal and pornographic political works. Now we can move on to the next slide. The map evidence of the Fulti database showing the distribution of such works by the STN before and after June 1784 suggests that the decree severely left damage to book dealers' pornographic trade. Um, if you look at that, we're okay for time. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's <laughs> so, very dark um, in France before the end of June. I allowed a few days for the decree to and start seeking through. And then we get a much broader dis distribution and a lighter, um, much lighter. Um, involvement of France in the trade thereafter. Um, it also damaged their regular trade, but despite their protests, the French did not relent in any way about this policy. So the static maps seemed conclusive, but oversimplified maps can of course be deceiving, and we don't have a full time depth there. And research for this paper asking some slightly more sophisticated questions of the database proved that my project's initial finding that 1783 was the decisive turning point was misplaced. Instead, it seems that an earlier piece of legislation targeted a different, a different illegal market um, led to the decline in the French highly illegal market, what, what Danton called liberty books, might be another way of thinking about this corpus of highly illegal works, um, and above all of pornography defined here as explicit depictions of the genitals or sexual acts for the purposes of arousal. Um, that's my definition of porn for these, these books, and it's important to the historiography of the subject for reasons we don't need to go to, that I actually distinguish that from mere erotica or um, softer forms of tales of human sexual or romantic activities. So if we move on to the illegal uh, here, on the 30th of August 1777, the French government passed a series of legislative acts designed to curb book trade copyright piracy. They included an amnesty on all pirated books in France, provided booksellers and printers declare them, and a new licensing system for which writers and publishers had to declare print rights of any privileged books they wished to print and to pay a fee. The laws also set up a tighter inspection system, attaching a government paid inspector to each of the country's 20 book guilds, the Chambres Anticales. This seems to have had the collateral effect of inhibiting the trade in pornography, as the graph shows. Up until 1770, the blue line for France is also almost exactly the same as the green line for the entire trade in pornography. Up to 1777, the STN's best clients for this sort of material were the French, and they were taking almost every book. Um, compared to taking 36% on average of the rest of the STN's book market. But after 1777, the French took very little of this literature. How did this compare then to the impact of the decrees on wider sections of the market? If we turn to the totality of Darnton's corpus, um, next, the next slide, um, which includes materialist philosophy, anti-clerical ribaldry, politically scandalous works, and so forth. There is a similar, though not so steep, sale as for pornography. Some clandestine works were still slipping through, but nowhere near as many. 
In fact, despairing of selling their illegal stocks, in April 1779, the SGN dumped a massive consignment of clandestine works on a specialist dealer in the sleepy French town of Lodin, a man named Malherbe, and he used it to supply underground travelling booksellers who plied their trade across Western France. I've taken this unique dumping out of my figures here to show that other than this desperate measure, the trade really came grinding to a stop. Um, in pornography and almost and hit the buffers for other works. Finally, by six, a slim, similar slump also hit STN book sales to France generally, but the dip was for, le for such works, lasted less time and was less than for clandestine literature. The trade in legal books recovered quite quickly after mid-1778 when they sent a salesman named Favager to drum up business inside France. Um, that new trade led to a boom, but it was short-lived. The decree of 1783 dealt a blow to the Swiss trade from which it never recovered. In conclusion, then, the digital evidence shows that the French did squeeze pornography out of their market and were fairly effective also against other clandestine books. However, did so in 1777, not as previously widely held in 1783. Ironically, a measure designed to stop piracy killed off sales of highly illegal works, while the 1783 decree against radical pornography was used to strangle French Swiss publishing in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, that was the fantastic presentation. Of I'm really pleased to see how, in such a wide range of ways, we've been able to address this, this theme, such a such a rich thing. Now we're going to move right along to our next presentation. Uh, Jen Ireland is going to speak about the right to be forgotten online. Thanks, Jen. <coughs> Thanks very much, Paul. And um, hello, everyone. I'm going to talk today about the right to be forgotten online, as Paul has said. Um, I have to out myself immediately, obviously, as being a lawyer and an IP, a media defamation type of lawyer. So I have a certain angle on this in my work. I'm going to try to only cover that quite briefly for the purposes of today's talk, though. Now, as I've said in the paper's abstract, what I'm going to address here is really the problems that can arise from the fact that, as is commonly said, the internet never forgets things. And I think we've all had experiences where sometimes we wish that it would. So I've taken that into a sort of subtitle for my talk today and called it The Internet Never Forgets, or Does It? Because we've had some new developments in this area that people may have heard about and that's been pretty prominent in the press over the last week. So I'll speak about those a little today. It's a very common problem that we're probably all familiar with. You can almost anybody you want to ask this question to is going to have some personal story or know of somebody who's had an issue with content being online that perhaps they wish wasn't there or was still there. It's probably a the issue for us. I'm going to borrow a quote from Professor Jeffrey Rose that I found in the Sydney Morning Herald just last week that I think perfectly captures this issue. And you should have that on the slide there for you at the moment, which is, in the age of Google, the worst thing you've done is the first thing people know about you. Now, if those people happen to be potential employers, maybe future parents in law or something like that, you can see the context. Oftentimes, or at least for me, I think, legally two questions follow, which is first, is there anything that you can do to remove that kind of content from the internet. And that is short of it being defamatory content. Now, if material and information about yourself is true, it's not a defamation action. That's a subject for me to deal with in the paper that will probably accompany this talk later on. So I won't go into the detail about that right here, but there's obviously a lot of legal analysis behind that point. However, <coughs> inconvenient truths, material that is true about you, but that you would rather it wasn't on the internet. What can we as individuals do to remove that material? And I think to connect with the thing of this conference as well, it's very much about regaining privacy by being lost online. 
However, if you're not able to remove underlying content, and this is where the recent case that has just been decided in the European Union comes into it, if you can't remove that content, can you nevertheless remove the search links to it? And is that a way of regarding the loss of privacy? Would that have an equivalent effect? I say, I think we can make a comparison to that's interesting with print materials. But we can say print materials are a natural type of obsolescence. And in the past, that's taken information about people into history and it's relegated it into history. Search engines obviously have a natural tendency to allow people to be able to dredge up all sorts of uh, content about others and to find out information which in print era would perhaps have been modest. Nowadays, so if it's on the internet, it tends to stay there. But if you add a search engine into that picture, people will find it. So how do we do that issue? The European Union has a greater recognition, and I'd say the greatest recognition around the world, in terms of a right to be forgotten. And although it's a print age concept, largely, and I won't go into the legal background of that again, that's something I can explore in the paper, uh, but although we have that print age sort of background, it has a new resonance with online environments and certainly with um, internet regulation more broadly. I'll take this, I think, I might actually, for the purposes of time, just jump straight into the actual case that's been decided last week, speak through a couple of the other points that's on the slide within that context. Google and Gonzalez was decided last week by the European Court of Justice. And it's really a very significant finding in the way of saying individuals can, in some circumstances, have a right to have search links removed online. We, sorry, I'll just jump a little bit. Yeah, I'll jump into some of the legal takeaway points from that case just to illustrate how this can happen. It's decided under the European Data Protection Directive. That Data Protection Directive is broadly a set of rules that govern how people's personal data can be collected and stored and what it can be used for. Now, the decision in Google and Gonzalez involved a gentleman who had a newspaper article that was true and accurate and didn't define him, but it described a situation in 1998 where he had to have his house sold in order to pay what it described as social security debts, or what I think we would understand as tax debts. 1998 article, but it kept coming up at the top of the Google search, uh, or towards the top of the Google search on his name. Now, unsurprisingly, perhaps, he was a solicitor. Often it is legal people who pursue these things through the courts. He wanted Google to take that search, uh, sorry, that search result. Under the database directive, he was entitled to request that kind of response if Google is a data controller, if what they do constitutes processing personal data, and if they have done something that is inconsistent with the purpose for which the data was originally collected. Now, I'm not going to go into the legal detail of that, that's something for a separate paper. But the upshot of the case, and I think really significantly, is Cook was found to have to comply, or, or rather was found to satisfy all those requirements, but therefore the database, uh, sorry, the data protection directive applies to Google. It followed from that, that Google did have to respond to his request to take down material or to take down those links because they were largely irrelevant or they become obsolete about him, I think is the terminology we're using now. From a defamation point of view, without going into the detail of that, I think I'd say that we've ended up with a situation where non-defamatory material has been or links to it at least, have been taken down in a situation where if the material did define Mr Gonzalez, he wouldn't have had to, or Google would not have had to remove its links. They would not have been considered to be a publisher. So it's an interesting decision from a legal standpoint in that it seems to take us into a place that information would not, not take you, but arguably in a situation that is, or at least wouldn't amount to defamation. It takes us effectively further than I think 
Impact Declaration does, and there's some interesting interplay between those issues. Question mark around whether a right to require Google to take down links to your content is actually almost an end game or an end run around the defamation given that will potentially operate where it, where defamation won't help you. I out of myself at the start of the of defamation at least that that is some of my work. Now one of the interesting we ask ourselves is that going to apply around the world? Now the legal answer to that is that we do have similar regimes or similar sets of rules in other jurisdictions. There's a very broadly similar set of rules in Australia and in many other jurisdictions to the Data Protection Directive. Now, if those terminologies or the wordings in those rules are similar to the European Data Protection Directive, then it's likely that we might see similar findings in other countries if individuals are prepared to pursue it. What's really interesting too, though, is that the decision here, although it's talked about a lot in the press as being about the right to be forgotten online, that is actually a new type of right that is not yet passed in the European Union. It's on its way through the European Parliament at the moment, where we have the directive, we're having regulations coming through, and Article 17 of the regulations contains the right to be forgotten or a right of the as it's interestingly called, and I apologise, there's a little noise outside. Um, so that's, that's an interesting one. Um, what it tells us is that the existing state of law, and to the extent that there's commonality with other countries, we're going to see, we potentially could see similar actions if individuals are wanting to pursue that type of action, just based on the law as it is without even an express right to be forgotten in those privacy principles as they appear elsewhere in the world. Now, where I think I'd like to connect with our... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been indicating the slides at all. I think actually Jason's been following me quite nicely. <laughs> uh, my apologies for that, yeah. Uh, I'm used to seeing it before me and I've actually got a timer on me to get me to move quite quickly at this point. Okay. For me, potentially, yes, we could see legal application of this around, the, or at least in other jurisdictions that have similar privacy rules in place that protect online data privacy for individuals. Potentially, that is a possibility. What I think we are more likely to see, and in the slide where I discuss consequences and questions, I'm not going to run through the full slide now, but I think we're much more likely to see search engines and companies like Google self-censor in response to people requesting takedowns and the early response to Google and Gonzalez has been that a lot of people come out of Google requesting things to be taken down. I'd say it's quite likely that rather than risk substantial fines in the EU, Google will be much more responsive now to take down requests from individuals. And I think we'll see that filter through the rest of the world. Our quest, and we've certainly seen a reaction very like that in relation to takedown requests and copyright piracy. So there are mechanisms in these companies already for responding in that way. And it's a natural risk management type of response, I would say, to respond to a request rather than risk a big fine, which seriously can be something like 2 to 5% of annual turnover. So it's big. If you're Google, that's really big. So you're not going to miss that over the takedown uh, notice. So I think we will see an element of self censorship. I think potentially, to the extent that internets, uh, sorry, that individuals can request certain facts about themselves to be removed. Where I take this across into a more digital humanities perspective, but probably a historical perspective, is to say, well, we talk about history as having been written on often by winners people who won the story, or people who have the ability to control the story. I think to the extent that the internet has been largely uncensored and contains all of this information, if we're now going to see individuals able to selectively remove parts of the internet's memory, then is that A, something that's desirable at all, and B, are we going to start seeing a form of revisionism coming in through this line? So I think it is a right that we'll probably see elsewhere. As I've said on the last slide, I learned right at the impacts, Jason. Um, 
as I've said right at the last slide, is it a good time to ask if there's something that you have online about you that you don't want to still be there? I would say in the wake of Google and Gonzales, yes it is. Probably a good time to ask. You may well have a legal right, but you may actually find that they're a lot more responsive. But I think the deeper question there really is getting the balance right between an internet that either self-censors or that individuals can censor, as opposed to the other, the flip side of that, which is something that I think most of us can relate to, is that we'd like some sort of control over how we appear online and what sort of information is online about us. So getting that balance right, I think, is going to be really interesting um, going forward. And I think that's as much as I, definitely as much as I have time to say, and I have run over, I apologise. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Just on time, which is fantastic, and we're going to move on to a, a talk uh, by Tony Lockley and Tony Webb Gannon, Gan Gan which has a fantastic title, uh, which I know we've read the abstract, but the title is Why are George Clerk's Eyes in the Sky? Please welcome our two speakers. Hello everybody. Um, we will explain why we're asking about George Clooney's Eyes in the Sky, but um, our talk is about a new research project that we've embarked on with uh, a group of people, which is about looking at surveillance, human rights, and evidence. Two million. This is the number of people that have been killed in Sudan's civil wars in the past 30 years. The government soon these armed forces and their allied troops have been at the centre of this, of this violence and Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, has been indicted by the International Criminal Court for genocide because of his role in, in what has happened. But despite this indictment, and despite all of the efforts of the United Nations, this humanitarian catastrophe continues, virtually unimpeded by international intervention. So in 2010, during a trip to uh, Sudan with a former US State Department official, John Prendergast, actor George Clooney queried why the world should be able to use uh, Google's satellites to zoom in and uh, look at his home and show this on the internet, but apparently not have any way of monitoring and reporting on the crimes that were happening in Sudan. So soon after, Clooney and Prendergast collaborated with a bunch of academics from Harvard University to set up the Satellite Sentinel Project. The project uses satellite images to collect information about human rights violations in Sudan from uh, satellites which is, which is situated 300 miles in the sky. When the Satellite Sentinel uh, Project researchers want to investigate an event or a location in Sudan, what they do is get the satellites positioned in the right place so that they're able to capture images and then carry out timely analysis of what's going on. The project then releases selected images and, uh, and their analysis of these via their own website, but also using the press so that they, like, quote their website, can tell the stories that alleged war criminals don't want told. The Satellite Sentinel Project locate, uh, has located mass graves, it's documented villages that have been thrown to the ground, and it's captured images that have preempted violence by showing things like and analysing events like the extension of an airstrip, or the mobilisation of armed forces, or the build up of armed tanks and artillery. The Digital Globe is the commercial company that provides the Satellite Sentinel Project with its images and with the analysis. Digital Globe's website states that it can collect, can collect 3 million square kilometres of images every day and that their image library is the largest in the world. And so while Digital Globe subsidises uh, many of the costs of this Satellite Sentinel project, it's still um, exorbitantly expensive and George Clooney covers these costs with the profits that he makes from his Nespresso advertisement. So on the one hand, looking at um, a project like this, you could say, hey, it's great, someone's doing something about what's happening in Sudan. On the other hand, you could say it's a little problematic that a Hollywood actor and a ex-US State Department official, without any kind of national or global law or regulation, are um, the people that are taking care of the situation, if you like. So our rationale for this project, though, or for looking specifically at the Satellite Sentinel project, 
is um, that really we see it as an early adopter project. Um, and so as an early adopter project, of uh, an early adoption of these kinds of technologies, particularly in the, in the context of human rights, we think that it gives us clues about the moral, ethical, legal, and policy challenges um, that we might need to consider if um, we're going to allow the expansion of these kinds of projects and if we're going to ensure that they're democratically and ethically driven and that there's some robust public debate about the best and right way forward for the question of image, uh, evidence like this. So our own research looks at the, the use of both drones and satellites for human rights surveillance. Um, there are many crossovers between drone and satellite uses, but the two are rarely discussed together. And sure, there are differences. Uh, global policy regulates satellites, while well, domestic policy regula regulates the use of drones, and of course drones are um, a lot more accessible. Um, they're much cheaper technologies. But both drones and satellites permit new kinds of evidence collection from above, and that's why we're bringing them together in our research project. Now these types of um, the evidence and the images that can be um, collected by drones and satellites can be used for forestry mapping, for oceanography, for climatology, astronomy, surveillance of criminals, detection of mass burial sites, and many more things. While access to these images was once very limited, it's now becoming increasingly um, democratised and accessible to um, everyday citizens and advocacy groups, and Hollywood stars like George Clooney are now making use of them to document, document evidence of human rights abuses and to imagine and propose social and environmental changes. So while, of course, uh, information and communication technologies like radio, like the internet, like uh, mobile and cameras, have received substantial critical analysis specifically in relation to the use in human rights and for the collection of evidence, we haven't really seen this kind of critique happen for satellites and drones as yet, more so for drones, as you say. So in light of this, our project seeks to examine new applications of satellites and drone images um, and to analyse the opportunities, risks and perceived benefits of having all of these eyes in the sky as a way to address human rights violations. Our research team believes that while the use of surveillance from the sky, um, uses of uh, surveillance from the sky are multiplying, questions uh, remain that really need to be answered. Who has access to these technologies and who does not? Who has the expertise to use these technologies effectively um, in human rights context? And could these new technologies inadvertently or otherwise contribute to human rights abuses? So coming back to the situation in Sudan, it's, um, it's worth also thinking about the efficacy of the Satellite Sentinel project. Because the International Criminal Court can't buy al-Bashir unless he leaves Sudan, because Sudan's not a signatory to the Rome Statute, which set up the International Criminal Court, um, the project, the Satellite Sentinel project, has also been carrying out advocacy to achieve their goals, rather than just relying on collecting evidence for um, a legal and court context. And to this end, the project seeks to provoke sufficient public outrage in order to influence those in power and to influence international civil society to then pressure their governments and to pressure the UN um, to intervene in the genocide. But how effective are the project methods? It's been in operation for four years now. Within what kind of time frame should a project like this aim to achieve its goal, especially when the genocide of the people is at stake? So you should be on the slide, yeah, because we have to pull issues. Um, and I think even if we ultimately agree that the ends and means are justified in this case of the Satellite Sentinel project, it still leaves us with a new question. If Al Bashir was apprehended and put on trial by the ICC, next week, would the Satellite Sentinel Project images be evidence worth? That is, would they comply with International Criminal, criminal Court's evidence guidelines? So the Satellite Sentinel Project relies on the adage that seeing is believing, that if the images collected by satellites of destruction in Sudan are made accessible and are viewed by the public, that the persuasiveness of the visual will prompt collective action towards intervention. However, while this might be an appropriate um, strategy or an appropriate form of human rights campaigning, the persuasive nature of visual evidence is of concern to courts. What if the technology itself overwhelms the jury? Or what if the spectacle causes a diversion from the case? The veracity of digitally produced images is also of concern to courts, given the error and manipulation that can occur at a number of stages in the image-making process. So at the stage of pre-launch satellite or in calibration, 
during the data collection or digital imaging processing, during storage and archiving, and at various points of retrieval and application. And added to concerns about the veracity of the images are jurisdictional issues about the legality of using satellite or drone images in international courts and tribunals. Beyond the issue, beyond the issue of legality and veracity of images, a serious critique about the rhetoric of technology democratisation is also required in this case. With specific regard to the Satellite Sentinel project, how accessible are the images collected by the project? Do they only release certain images and deliberately abstain from publishing others that might make us feel less certain about the ethics um, of their work? Do the satellite images capture private images in everyday prisons, for example? And what is the ideology at work behind the taking of these images, and does that even matter? And furthermore, not all human rights organisations have ambassadors with advertising slush funds from which they can pay the high costs of both satellite images and um, the salaries of forensic interpreters. Given the prohibitive costs and the specialist skills often required, can we really fully democratise use of drone and satellite technologies for evidence collection? Is this even desirable? These are the questions driving our research. So our team is cross-disciplinary and it's made up of lawyers, a criminologist, a forensic scientist, a conflict analyst, a human rights researcher and an archaeologist. This spread of expertise drawn from institutions around the world um, allows us to probe the efficacy and ethics of the use of satellite images by human rights bodies from legal, sociological and technical perspectives in order to produce theoretically and practically credible research. Our team is currently putting together a funding proposal so that we can explore how surveillance from the skies can be used more effectively and ethically by human rights defenders. In short, we see our project as creating a metaphorical pair of glasses for the eyes in the sky. Glasses that help ethically frame and focus in on the veracity of the images gathered by satellites and drones for human rights contexts through the development of a human rights toolkit. The use of drones and satellites for collecting evidence in human rights context is definitely on the rise. Because of this, we want to focus on supporting responsible, effective and ethical use of drone and satellite technologies for evidence collection. Without careful consideration of these issues, there will not be anything democratic about all those eyes in the sky. It tends to be the case that um, we know that policy always follows practice when technology uh, comes into play. So this isn't going to be an exception. But what we hope is that our project might at least be able in some way to push forward the debate about the risks involved and play um, some role in supporting the ethical uptake and use of these new technologies to collect evidence that ultimately may serve to advance justice and support human rights and address, I should say, human rights violations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that presentation. Now we're going to move on to our final individual presentation, which will be by David Tate, on the topic of Gateways to Justice, Transforming the Remote Witness Experience. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. It's a very interesting type of event. Um, and I think what I'm going to be talking about is um, something that really uses the same technology but um, for vulnerable people. And it's about use of video links for remote witnesses in courts. Um, it's part of a whole series of technology type research that we do. Um, and we've got various partners. They're always courts. Prosecutors, police tend to be the partners, they have particular issues, but then we bring a more theoretical perspective to bear. So it's a, it's a conversation in which they have practical needs and we have theoretical issues. Um, and one of the theoretical debates I'll be talking a little bit about later in the light of this focus is about um, surveillance and privacy. Um, but this particular project originated with, with two somewhat separate type of demands. Um, when you think of the word remote, um, there's actually two different uses of it, and particularly this is true in courts. One is remote for access, 
and the other is remote for separation. Now, in Australia, as in Canada, there are enormous different distances between different locations. And sometimes it's very hard for people to get to major centres. So providing video links allows much greater access for people in, in remote areas. And this is particularly the case with Aboriginal communities in Western Australia. And indeed, the Western Australian Justice System was one of our partners. Uh, but there's another type of remoteness which is important, and this is important uh, for vulnerable witnesses particularly, uh, where they want to be separate from the person that they allege abused them. They don't want to be in the same building. And in a sense this is access too, because it allows them to then participate um, in the hearing in a way that they, they wouldn't be able to if they felt constrained to be in, this, in the presence of the uh, of the alleged abuser. Okay, so what did we do? Um, if you just sort of go and talk to people, do interviews and so on, you, you find out people's opinions, but no one really takes it very seriously. And when you ask for money, they will say, oh, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? So what we found is you really have to do randomised controlled trials of some sort. Uh, now it's not quite as good as uh, medical ones. We can't strap people down and, you know, fill them with drugs and so on. So, but we do um, claim that they are more realistic in the sense that we try to use as real world settings as we can. And in this particular case with remote witnesses, we had one of the best um, courtrooms in Australia um, in the Melbourne County Court. And um, so what we do, being an experiment, the idea is you've got to have two different conditions. And so what we did is we used the ordinary remote witness room that's available. It's actually slightly better than most places. And a remote witness room, if you haven't seen one, it's, it's an old broom closet. They take out the brooms and they put in witnesses and they put, in a, they put a microphone in your face and a camera right in front of you and, and you feel so intimidated that um, you're likely to tell the truth on these things. <laughs> okay, so, well, that, that's the standard condition. Now, we had an enhanced condition. Because this is a, a project funded by our research council, um, we had a doctoral student, and we were so lucky we had an architecture doctoral student. So we, we gave her $20, told her to go out to iCare, and completely refit out a beautiful uh, room that the Melbourne County Court gave us. It was a lovely meeting room to start with, and she made it even more beautiful. With lots of tapestries and wall hangings and lovely um, and good use of colours, carpet, and all for twenty dollars mind you, and, and a very comfortable and somewhere to put your hand back. So we randomly assign witnesses and they're all volunteers, we weren't gonna you know, take vulnerable people and push them into this. Um, to first of all we gave them a little bit of a experience that they um, to you know get them primed up. And so we, we got them to see an assassination. Well, actually, it wasn't a real assassination. It was a um, from Vin Vendor's film, uh, The American Friend. There was an assassination on the subway. Um, so we got the witness to see this, you know, about seven minutes of it. So he's stalking someone else and then shooting them as they're going up an escalator. Um, and, and so they were either in this enhanced condition or in the, the standard condition. But, and this is what's interesting, we didn't just change the environment we also change the process. So they either have the standard process, which is your online speak, and the person freezes and doesn't know what to say, and somebody asks them a rude question, um, and they look unreliable, unreliable and shifty because they didn't know how to respond. Um, or what we did was we had a whole, we changed the ritual. So the judge um, started by welcoming somebody, explaining what was going to happen in the technology, got them to speak and say, well, would you speak up a bit? Can you see me? I can see you. So there's a bit of a, um, what we call a kind of Bauhaus approach to technology, openly proclaim it and celebrate it. You don't kind of hide it away. And so um, some people got this enhanced ritual and enhanced um, environment. Other people got the, you know, the standard stuff and then do other conditions. So we randomly assigned the witnesses to see these, to these four conditions, and we had a whole bunch of jurors, some of whom are real jurors who were sent upstairs for the purpose um, to watch it and see how they responded. So, so that was 
uh, what we did, and then over several weeks, we were able to say what difference it makes. And then, of course, we can say, here's the evidence. Why don't you go about um, changing it? Now, um, the thing I've learned about digital humanities uh, from my wonderful friends here is that it's actually a kind of conversation. It's not really a single set of theories, um, not only even a single discipline. It's a conversation between people who bring their different perspectives to bear. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the, um, the two issues that we're talking about, um, about surveillance and privacy. Okay, so first of all, in terms of privacy, there's several sorts of privacy that are involved here. One is protecting what we could call the psychological safety of the witness, so they're not required to go into a confronting situation. Um, so, but also that they, they can't be intimidated. Uh, but there's a second sense of uh, privacy as well, in that um, you can create distance between conflicting parties. So that um, from the point of view of the court, you don't have a big bust up in the courtroom. People, and it's particularly the case with bikey games. They like to use the courtroom as a, a place of ongoing conflict. Um, so that, that's privacy. Um, now, in terms of surveillance, um, it, it allows the court to see the witness. And in some ways, it see them even better than they would if they were in, in the witness box on the far side of the room. In fact, lawyers sometimes say they can see the sweat in the witness's face better when they're remote. Um, so it certainly allows a one form of uh, surveillance. But there's another form of surveillance as well, which is a traditional common law thing called confrontation, <laughs> in which the, um, the person on trial has the right to see their accuser, you know, not intimidate them, but at least see them. And by having a video, that's possible as well. Um, there's a third form of surveillance as well, which is for experts, and they want to see the audience. So they're explaining something, and you're like, I can't see what you're doing. I don't know whether you're nodding because you agree with me, or you're nodding because you're falling asleep. Well, that's exactly the same for ex witnesses when they're trying to explain something to a jury. So they want to see the faces of the jury, provide surveillance over the jury, so if they're not being clear, they can clarify things better. So anyway, that, that's the kind of how I'm bringing this um, into the, this conversation about privacy and surveillance. Um, there's a couple of things I'd just like to mention, things we learned totally unintentionally. Um, that, and in fact, one of the fun things about doing research is you learn a whole lot of things you don't intend to learn. Um, and and the, the two things I think are particularly interesting for any use of video, one is about um, colour, the colour of people's faces. Now, you might say, well, what does that matter? Well, it matters a huge amount in Western Australia or Queensland where a lot of the defendants are Aboriginal. Now, and the cameras that most courts have, if you've got a black face and a white shirt, it goes for the lightest part of, your, of the screen, and so you just can't see them at all. And so we're kind of suggesting that either people change the colour of their shirt or they uh, put shawls on, um, or they really expensive cameras, and the International Criminal Court has this problem all the time, they use expensive cameras. Um, but there's another thing that was sort of a little bit, um, you know, a little bit delicate perhaps, and perhaps it might relate that to the kind of pornography issues that Simon was talking about, is that if the camera is too high and people um, don't aren't dressed properly, sometimes uh, they look in a way that they wouldn't like to be seen. So it provides a kind of surveillance that's inappropriate. So it's necessary for people to be able to see themselves. So surveillance shouldn't be just by others, it should be by yourself so you can see whether you're being seen as you want to be. And then and then the final um, aspect of being seen was that we designed this beautiful background and having watched uh, a lot of good TV programs <laughs> background is important. We have these lovely stripes in the background. Now, people who are relatively slender <coughs> look really good. And in fact, they probably look more credible on it. But people that were quite so skinny actually spread out over these lines. And it kind of made them look like total lines. So, so we have to think about how do you design something that's beautiful but fair to all of the different um, participants. 
Anyway, that, that's mine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now we have a short time for our uh, panel conversation. So I think what we'll do is ask um, the speakers to come up and we'll, we'll gather around uh, in view of, of the camera. Uh, maybe we can turn this off. about themes and issues that might emerge uh, from our, our very different but, but linked presentations. And I thought that I might kick off our conversation with a question which could be asked, answered by one or more of you, uh, as, as you wish. Um, and that is, how have our attitudes to surveillance and privacy changed over the last decade? Uh, the decade of social media, when we've exposed more of our personal lives to the world than ever before, but also the, the decade we talk about our lives and behaviours has become one of the most valuable and coveted sets for governments and commercial organisations. That same data is also shaped on how we behave in, as individuals in a complex and fast-changing society. So the question I'd like to pose is, how have our attitudes changed over the last decade? I'll start. <laughs> You know, I, I think it's. A, I mean, I'd, I'd like to know if we have any kind of study on attitudes that, that reveal these. But what we hear all the time is, um, I think, mythologies about, particularly about young people, and the notion that you know, simply because they're sharing uh, things that they they wouldn't have about, had about themselves, that they have a different perspective on privacy. And I think what we're forgetting there is the issue of control and choice. And, um, you know, I, I was very interested to see a study by the uh, University of Queensland by Mark Andrew Derrick, which studied the Australian population last year and asked them about how they're feeling about privacy and understanding the kind of surveillance that might be going on on their website. And most Australians are not happy with it. The majority of Australians were very uncomfortable with it. I think it's an issue of power and, and what they think they can do about it. But I also think in this country it's an issue of priorities. And we haven't seen the same kind of outrage and uprisings we've seen in other countries, including in the US and the UK. And I, I, th I think, you know, that that may be in part risk and what's at stake, but I think also it's a level of kind of awareness. I think people shy away from this discussion because they feel they don't know much about the technology. So I feel that, um, if anything, as surveillance increased, so has our anxiety about it. Um, I certainly don't think that people are more comfortable than the past about having things I'm not mind writing a note here about Australians tolerant, lazy, or uninformed. <laughs> Is it something specific about our, our part of the world where we might approach this differently to somewhere else? Are there legal reasons for them, Jim? Look, um, not necessarily. It's something I ask my legal students about when I teach them, and it's, the responses are often quite interesting, I think. Something I feel anecdotally is that my sense of what constitutes privacy, particularly in an online context, is very different from those of the typical student generation who obviously much younger than I. They will tend to respond to me, interestingly, and it, it can be as interesting as what you're saying, but they, they tend to say to me that they, they don't really care about it. And I'll say, does it concern you that Facebook might be data mining your private emails, for instance? Now, that got a bit of a as did the would you like to be able to take the client out the thing that I was speaking about in my talk. But that was something that we engaged with, certainly. Um, we could say in terms of 
it hasn't quite, for me, it hasn't quite filtered up into a legal issue yet, certainly not in Australia. I think we're starting to see the start of these sorts of questions coming up in the legal spectrum. If you see a new case, given Gonzalez, that's the start of some things. Uh, but beyond that, the greater data protection and regulation, particularly around data mining, I think we're starting to see some regulation of that. New Australian privacy principles coming in March, and that has got more scope. But then the enforcement mechanism has been, a price, uh, has been a problem with privacy issues in Australia in the past. This one hopefully will be better than its predecessors. Um, so it's, I think a lot of it is a question about whether people can enforce it and who's going to step up. Do people actually want to make a court case or not? And oftentimes they don't because they perceive things that happen on social media, in my view, as being not particularly serious. And perhaps there's a lack of awareness of this data mining backdrop that's beyond it. So, yeah, uh, that's... Yeah. I'd like to make a distinction between different sorts of privacy. One is protecting your information from the government. The second is information that's used for your own benefit, potentially, or to be, uh, particularly with health records, uh, having a continuous chain. And the third, and which is the thing that's been changing, is information about you in the public domain that allows you to be shamed and humiliated. And I think that's the thing that we're getting more and more concerned about. And in relation to how Australians might be different, in relation to, compared to the US, I'd say we're more trustful of government. So we don't mind government having as much information about us as they do. At least we don't complain about it. Um, but we are concerned in the private domain of being shamed. A really interesting response that I have had from my students too is that they don't really care so much if their information's been done or they know about that. They know that when you get the rewards card at the supermarket, you're getting a discount, but you're giving them your data. And oftentimes the response I get is that people know about that and they're okay with it, they sort of withdraw it, which is interesting. So yeah, I'm not saying that I agree with that, but yeah, it's an interesting response. Just to, um, Simon, I'd like to ask you a question about the difference between you know, 18th century France and, and things like um, and, uh, the fact that people would often uh, put forward their views um, under pseudonyms or anonymously, or and the most um, the, mo the, the most controversial statements would often be would, would be hidden in various ways. It seems like a very different world to the one that we're living in now, where, where people uh, well, you can still hide your views, but you can be tracked back to your IP address. Um, you know, historically, how, how much has it changed? Are there any common elements between 18th century France and, and, the, old, and, the, and the, the work that you've been looking at in, in the privacy domain? It's a big question. I haven't thought about the question, and I think it makes all sorts of issues. The first, the first one is 18th century France, while it was a, um, an absolute monarchy, um, certainly not a despotism, the rule of law applied, but on the other hand, crimes of less majesty, crimes of expression, um, as seen by the government, could result in very serious punishment. And in fact, none of the pornographic and scandalous libels against Marie Antoinette that were being policed actually appeared in print before the revolution, um, when they acquired new meanings as well within the internal of that context. Um, partly because no one dared to publish them. The government tended to try to suppress them by secret agents, paying people off or failing that more draconian things. They were usually produced overseas, so there were risks in that. Um, but if that, if that failed, uh, once the French government stopped paying the blackmailers, the documents stopped being produced. Unfortunately for the French government, they were a, um, well, they had a data repository of this stuff, basically. They bought the stuff up, they shipped it to the Bastille, along with all sorts of other illegal they pulled most of it, but they kept a few copies of everything. And they had many hundreds of different works in the Bastille, like the Storm, the entrepreneurial publishers published this stuff. Um, so that, that does suggest that there are some very interesting similarities. They had very, very rich police records, which were used. They were eavesdropping conversations. Um, and so maybe this is a conversation that they had. That's why I like to listen. Um, I'm sure that have put in, 
in the US who I was talking to the other day is the, one of the world's biggest experts on those police eavesdropping reports. And she's very interested in, in developing and discussing with me how we might look at those things. So I hope perhaps we'll have a digital project on eavesdropping in the past. Maybe that should be a, a joint interdisciplinary project out of this group. Let's do eavesdropping then. Thank you very much for the suggestions. We've got a couple of minutes before we, we finish our session. We've got one to wrap up tonight. Any reflections on our, our deliberations today or the format of the, of the uh, gathering? I'm encouraged by a critical attitude that has emerged from, from this discussion. i uh, go back to something that Ned uh, Roster said at the beginning when he referred to the traditional humanities and that um, got me to thinking about our claim be doing things that we do. I think if you look at what we do historically, that uh, newness begins to dissolve away. It is a real historical question of enormous importance what we are doing that is new, and it's not at all obvious. Um, one of the things that has been much celebrated and much acted upon as being new is the creation, and this ties in with privacy, of memory archives. Now, memory archives are, are largely uh, family photograph albums made digital. But the the question that arises it as a kind of transcendental good that, mem that to remember is necessarily good. I recall um, Borges' story, Funes Memorias, about a man who goes insane because he can't forget anything. What I hear from the privacy discussions, which I haven't really thought about much before, is that um, it gives a kind of ironic cast to Marshall McLuhan's celebration of the global village. If anyone knows what village life is really like, you will know about communities that can't forget. You're the person whose grandfather killed my grandfather's pig is the kind of memory of a village. And that's what we're getting here. So we really need this, um, what did someone call it? Ned called it, strategies of resistance. We need to think about what we're doing and to be critical about it. It's enormously important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to wrap up in the, in the last, last minute, I'd like to um, thank everybody for their participation here. We've had presentations on uh, the digital aspects of the study of various kinds of global transfer of circulation and circulation of many kinds from the movement of goods uh, and services through logistics and infrastructure through the historical circulation of censored material and books uh, and the circulation of ideas including the application of law in an increasingly globalised world eyes in the sky looking through satellites and drones and at our behaviour um, for good and, and for bad um, without clear ethical frames. And presentation finally uh, on the idea of remoteness, uh, access versus separation, and of uh, the need for further research into the very mode of delivery that we're using for this innovative conference, which is a distributed uh, format where people can participate remotely in, in an event. Uh, we've been together but apart for the last hour, um, together here as a group, and I'd like to thank again our presenters, the audience, uh, Jason Ensor for his work facilitating the technical aspects, but also the global viewers um, of this live streamed event, and especially the organisers who um, initiated this, this event. Well, thank you very much. It's been a fantastic thing for us to participate in, and with that, we'll sign off from Australia. Thank you. Well, thank you to the University of Western Sydney for a fabulous and diverse uh, look at privacy and surveillance. Uh, I think uh, Paul Arthur mentioned how, how this topic brings together people from very different perspectives and it, it was, uh, as was seen in the, in the richness of the presentations. I, also, I, I was also struck by the uh, historical connection 
or the importance of understanding the history of these technologies and issues that uh, Willard McCarty brought up there at the end and how we've seen over the day, we've actually seen people like uh, the panel from the Netherlands and also some of our colleagues from Ritsumeikan who have been, who have been uh, rethinking some of their more traditional digital humanities research in terms of what it can offer to uh, our understanding of privacy. I think uh, Willard reminded us of the dangers of uh, village life, especially a global village life. Um, but I also think that this type of internet uh, conference, while it has some features of a village, uh, it also brings together people from very different cultures, very different perspectives on an issue. And I think that's something that's important too, is that we learn about the narrowness of our views when we hear people from different uh, continents talking about something we thought was obvious.